Baptist Church. Oh, hello. Oh, there we go. Yeah, Southern Baptist Church called Redeemer Church in you know, Urbana. You know, and uh, we uh, I got to meet me, me Jan, uh, you know, in February. So he's he's been a joy to get to know. And uh, so anyways, um, but yeah, so yeah, who you're speaking to is uh, it's kind of a conglomeration of some people with our church, some people with a Campus Outreach Eastern Illinois, another guy who's a missionary in Mexico with Campus Outreach right over here, and then uh, a fraternity, agriculture fraternity, ag authority, um, others, yeah, so so anyways, not just strictly our church, but just kind of, so just to let you know, kind of that's uh, yeah, who you're speaking with, and uh, so yeah, it's kind of interesting, um, I, uh, I first heard you speak uh, no, what was it? Yeah, 2003 on a summer project on the test of true belief. And uh, that was the first time I had biblical assurance as a, a believer. And then um, and then 2000, and what was that, six? Between meetings, you, you had about 10 minutes and you called me before I went to Mexico. You probably don't even remember that. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember a lot since the heart attack. Oh, yeah. Well, the the uh, the great advice you had is don't spread yourself too thin. As I went there to study abroad, but to focus in one or on one or two people and just yeah. really go deep there. And so I took your advice, and the Lord really blessed me with a great relationship with a guy named Kike. And uh, he became a Christian and just got trained up and went on various summer projects with Campus Outreach. Now he's uh, on staff there um, with Campus Outreach kind of the Mexican director there. And uh, and now me and my family, we're about to go with a cross-cultural project to Mexico for the summer. Um, so I keep on talking to you right before I go to Mexico. So yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, um, so yeah, that's a little bit of the background. So, so anyways, um, yeah, so, some people know more about you than, than others. Some are, um, so anyways, just, but with these uh, different questions that we have for you, we, um, I'd love for them to get to know your life, a little bit, your testimony, your wife's testimony. Um, and then we have, so anyways, there's about 10 questions worth. And so uh, that, that might be, uh, I don't know how much we can cram in an hour, but uh, <laughs> but anyways, that's the, that's the deal. But uh, before we get started, do you happen to have any questions for us? No, no, it's great to see all of you. And especially uh, how many are students, all of them are students at University of Illinois? Most. Wow. Yeah, I've been I've been there several times uh, back when I was in college. Um, it's one of the coldest places on the planet in the winter. <laughs> and, uh, but now, um, do they still have? It's a pizza place called Papa Dell's. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, man. I went there a week ago. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Love you too. <laughs> that was that was you know how you you always you hear hype about some restaurant or some pizza place and I'd heard all this hype and I finally went to it uh one time when I went up there during my college years and I thought, "Oh my goodness, this is not a lie." It was <laughs> It was wonderful. I actually had someone years later bring me one frozen. <laughs> I don't know where I was, but they brought it to me several hundred miles away. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Oh man. Papa Dell's great spot. So yeah. Oh good good deal. Well, thanks a lot, brother. Appreciate your time. And um, but yeah, before we get started, would you mind praying for us? Sure. Sure. Okay. Father, I thank you for this great privilege to be here and Lord to meet with with these young people and I pray Lord that you would guide us with your grace that you would uh, give us insight into your word and that we would do that which is pleasing most pleasing to you and your son and your spirit in Jesus name amen amen <clears throat> yeah uh, yeah first question just real quick just how's your health uh, well um, the heart situation seems to be under control. I have a good cardiologist, and um, the the brain is still coming coming along. Um, 
they said it would take about four years. But, um, you know, when uh, they actually went out, you know, and told my wife I was pronounced dead like three times. And um, my brain went without oxygen for so long that they told my wife that I would be institutionalized if I survived, that I would never speak or be able to talk or just anything, respond. And uh, that's what was so funny when I came up out of the coma and uh, the doctors, you know, they said, do you know who you are? And I said, yes, and told them my name. They started calling doctors from everywhere. And I didn't know why. I didn't know what had happened, really. And um, I said, you know, why are all of you here? Um, and, and this one doctor from, uh, I think he was from China, he looked at me and he goes, you don't understand. You died three times. <laughs> and um, it, I wish I had said something spiritual, but I quoted Buck from Ice Age. <laughs> I died, but then I lived. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and it's been a long journey. It's been very hard. The mind is a very complex thing. Um, but uh, I've also suffered since I was in college with chronic pain. So. Um, I go on Monday for an experimental. They're going to see if I qualify for an experimental surgery on my spine where they're going to remove actually a few discs and replace it with uh, titanium. So wow. we'll see. So you can pray for me on Monday. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, thanks for filling us in. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so or, did Jacqueline happen to show you the... Uh, the, the questions that we're wanting to go through? Yeah, I looked at them briefly, but I usually don't look at questions even when it's a conference. I like to kind of fly off the cuff. So, <laughs> oh, all right. So, um, so, yeah, just knowing we have various questions. So, I guess probably more on the brief end of answers may be the, uh, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Shortly. Um, but, anyways, I'd love for you to briefly share with us your testimony. Okay. Yeah. Christian, and then a little bit more like missionary journeys, and you got married. Anyways, yeah. I um, I was converted at the University of Texas when when I was nine years old at a um, a church in Illinois. I had this quite amazing experience, and um, thought I was converted, but you know there was no discipleship. No one even talked to me before baptism. I don't think, and uh, and I, I wasn't truly converted. That demonstrated itself and that quickly, you know, I I departed and had no care for the things of God. And then when I was 17, my father and I were uh, working on the farm and and he yelled and I started to fall and I caught him and uh, he died in my arms. And I was a very ungodly teenager, but and it didn't change me in any way, but it, it got me to start thinking. Um, I really respected my father. And uh, he was a quite an amazing man. And I realized he was dead, that it didn't matter how wealthy you are, you're going to die. He was very intelligent, but you're going to die. You fall in love, you're going to die. And um, I, I drank quite a bit. And um, just because I, I kind of lived life as an absurdity, you know, there's no reason. The, the only place I found reason was in the classroom in the sense of just trying to make straight A's. <laughs> and I didn't even know why. Um, and I went off to college to Murray State University and then the University of Texas. And it was there that uh, I was miserable, just miserable one night. And I, I was into weightlifting really heavy and I was in steroids really heavy. And um, it was about one o'clock in the morning, and I kept saying to myself, sitting on the side of the bed, I'm so miserable. I'm just miserable. I wish I could take these steroids and they would kill me. Uh, but, you know, that's not the way steroids kill you. And, um, and someone knocked at the door, and it was a little freshman. I opened the door, and he was, you know, about five foot seven and really nervous. And I thought someone had maybe tried to rob him or something. I didn't know what was going on. And I said, yeah. And he goes, uh you're probably going to hit me because I was I was really kind of aggressive. And I said, well, it's one o'clock in the morning. You're probably right. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, why are you knocking on my door? And he said. He said, for two weeks, God has been telling me to come and talk to you 
but I've been afraid and I can't stand it anymore. And I, I kind of laughed and I thought, oh man, this guy, you know, he's hearing God, you know? And I, so I laughingly said, um, so what does God, what's God's message for me? And he said, uh, you're miserable and you're going to remain miserable until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And he was with uh, Campus Crusade, which now is known as Crew, I think. And he talked to me like four in the morning. We just walked around campus and he told me something, you know, I used all the typical excuses, like part of my family's Catholic, part of my family's Protestant. I don't want any part to do with any of that. And, and he stopped me and he said, um, he said, uh, that's an excuse. He said, I've not mentioned Catholicism or Protestantism or a church. I've only talked to you about the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And he goes, you can't escape this. You have to decide who is he. And uh, a few weeks later, guys kept visiting me and I kept trying to avoid them or I'd try to be nice. But and then one day in the, in the library, we were running off some oil surveys. I was going to be an oil and gas lawyer, and uh, that's what I wanted to be. And um, this girl asked me to a party, and I said no. And I had gotten to the point where I didn't party. I just would sit in a bar, like with old people, and just drink by myself. And, uh, and I said, I'm not going to your party. And she said, why? And at that moment, I don't even know why I said this. I just said, because uh, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. And my friends turned around and they looked at me like, man, that was cold even for you. You know, even for you, that was, you know, that was beyond the bounds. Because it was a time when people still, you know, respected God's name. And, uh, and it was like, have you seen one of those cartoons where a light bulb just turns on? And that's the way it was. It was like, and it wasn't like my deep, sinfulness, you know, even though I knew I was a sinner, it wasn't like broken over. It was just literally, I felt like I was, I don't know, literally flooded with the love of God, how much God loved me. And I knew that it was because Jesus died for me. And I ran out of there and I realized I'm different. I mean, in a second, it was like, it was like I changed. And I ran back to the apartment complex and found that guy. And I said, you got to help me. I said, I'm scared. And he said, what's wrong? I said, all I know is I'm not the same person who walked in that library. Something has happened to me. I am believing in Jesus. And and the love of God is so great that I, I just feel like I'm, I'm I don't know, I, I, like I'm going to run out of my mind or something. And there was this big Texan who was the resident dorm resident guy. and he was a little bit older than us and he was a stronger Christian. He was with crew and we knocked on his door and he looked out, he towered over me and I'm six two. And he, go, he goes, what's up? And my friend goes, Paul needs to tell you something. And he said, what? And I said, I don't know. All I know is I've been changed and I'm believing in Jesus. And that big Texan goes, buddy, you just got born again. <laughs> And I said, and I said, what is that? You know, I was scared to death. And and what was great was, uh, and this is so important for you college students. A lot of people were amazed in the next year how much I grew. Like I grew like a weed. I mean, but it wasn't because there was something spiritual or unique about me. There was a group of guys on campus, and they took me in. There were Christian brothers on campus and they took me in. I mean, they had me live with them and <laughs> in the house. Uh, I went with them everywhere and uh, they were such a powerful influence on my life. And I never forgot, you know, we grow in the context of of other people. We, we don't grow because we're some prophet who spends his time on a mountaintop somewhere. We grow, you know, if you're in college. I'm so glad. I, I, it bothers me so much. I love all the college ministries that preach the gospel, but it bothers me that so many of them are so separated from a local church. You need a local church and you need you need young people and you need old people. You need people like you and people not like you. 
and you need to grow in that kind of context. And fortunately, that's what was given to me as a gift. I guess the Lord knew I was so weak. He just inundated me with wonderful, wonderful saints. And um, so that's how that's how I was converted. And then um, I um, got out for a year and went back to this little church in Illinois. Um, was that Metropolis or? Yeah, Metropolis, the home of Superman. And uh, <laughs> And there was a, a little church out in the middle of uh, a cornfield. And this pastor, a very simple and kind man, uh, Jack Russell. And he just took me in as a friend. I mean, like a father. And uh, I was with him for a year. And then I went on to seminary. And my last few weeks at seminary, it became clear the Lord wanted me to go to Peru. And a missionary an old uh, what was called Faith Baptist missionary invited me to go, and I served for almost 11 years in Peru, and during that time started Heart Cry, and then Heart Cry grew, and I had to come back to the States in order to, you know, kind of direct it. So that's how it happened. Wow. I'm sure you could spend hours telling us about time in Peru, that's for sure. Right? Oh, I've got more stories than you guys have time to listen to. God is um, he, he is enduring in his faithfulness. That's what you need to understand. There are no great men or great women of God. A lot of times you'll read missionary biographies and you'll think, I can't live up to this. The fact is no one can live up to any of that. And if you see an exceptional person or you see a person do something exceptional at a certain time, it's the grace of God working through that person. And, and I am so aware of that. I mean, I know things that the Lord has allowed me to do that I look back on now and I realize almost with fear, how, how did I do that? I couldn't do that. It's, it's not possible knowing my weaknesses, knowing my fears. And, and what I want you to know is that if you're in the will of God, every circumstance he will strengthen you to, to overcome. He, he will help you. And at the times when he doesn't help you, that's necessary too. Because those times he don't help you and you fall on your face are reminders to you that even in my greatest moments, this wasn't me. It was the grace of God working through me. You know, many of you have probably thought, you know, if there's persecution one day, will I stand? Will I be able to bear with it? And uh, the answer is yes, you will. Not because you have an exceptional character, but because God will strengthen his people and help them to overcome. And in those times when it doesn't seem like they're strengthening, he has another purpose, but it's still a good purpose. I think that, that some of my failures have helped me in the long run far more than my victories. As long as every failure, you, in every failure, that you don't listen to the devil. When you fail, the devil will tell you, God doesn't love you, go away. That's never God's voice. When you fail, God's always saying, return, return to me, come to me, depend on me again. And that's how we discern God's voice, really. God will rebuke you, and he will rebuke you with very, very hard language, but it will always be followed up with return. I love you. Return. If you ever hear a rebuke and it's basically followed with go away, God doesn't love you anymore, or go sit in the penalty box for a few days and then think about coming back, that's not God. It's never God. Thank you. <clears throat> Now, when you said like, um, <clears throat> yeah, if you would touch it just briefly, it's kind of one of my last questions, but uh, when you talk about persecution, like um, just in brief, what would you say like trajectory wise in the U.S. just when it comes to the persecution of Christians, just thoughts you have? Yeah, well, I, I have to be in a conference at the end of the summer with Dr. MacArthur and others in, in England. Um, about this very issue. It's getting so close in England that, uh, and what it is going to be is just a silencing of the church. Um, you see, 
being very careful with our interpretation of the book of Revelation. Um, you know, there were two witnesses, and um, although we surely can't identify those witnesses with certainty, um, it does at least give us an application with regard to the church. You know how the fire comes out of their mouth, you know? And uh, I think more the idea there is that when God has a witness on the earth, in one way it um, it is like constantly adverse to the earth. You know, everybody in the world is okay with everything. And then the church comes along and says, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. And it's like fire coming out of our mouth. If you think about the Christian church is the only entity on the whole planet that actually stands against immorality. It points out and says, no, we're wrong. You're wrong. I'm wrong. We need a savior. And it afflicts the earth. And the one thing that the devil and the world desires is to silence that message. And they will silence it through deception or through intimidation. And um, everything that happens on this planet is done either for or against the church. Everything. The church is the only organization God has on the planet. Not a missionary agency, not anything. The church. And... Uh, Everything that's happening right now in America and Western Europe has to do with the silencing of the church and the silencing of the church's testimony against the evil of mankind, you see. And so a way has been discovered, you know. It's called um, tolerance. It's called hate speech. Tolerance is a very good word, and hate speech is a really bad thing. The only problem is when you have authorities that go ahead and define what intolerance is and authorities that go and define what hate speech is so that one day when you're arrested you won't be arrested as christians you'll be arrested as right-wing fundamentalists who take a literal interpretation of the bible and who are full of hate the world's not going to have a problem with their redefinition of christian a christian is a person who believes that Jesus is a savior and who teaches people to love. You're going to say Jesus is not a savior. He is the savior. And that's going to cause people to hate you. And that's what happened in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire had all kinds of gods, multiple gods, I mean, thousands of gods. And they traded gods like baseball cards. Um, no one had a problem. No one said anything about anybody else's God. And then Christianity shows up and says, all your gods are false. You see, I would be on all the talk shows in America tomorrow and be greatly loved if I would just change an indef uh, a definite article to an indefinite article. If I stood up and said, Jesus Christ is a savior and Jesus Christ saved me and Jesus Christ died on the cross, Everyone would love me, but it's when I say Jesus Christ is the Savior to the exclusion of all other saviors that it causes people to hate. <clears throat> yeah, would you mind speaking into the, uh, you know, this, this could be a whole conference. Anyways, um, but to at least, at least briefly touch on kind of the LGBTQ community, like how are we to respond to them? And also just how are we to think about, I mean, that's very connected to politics, but just how would we, as faith, you know, seek to be faithful Christians, how should we think about politics? And Well, with regard to politics, please, first of all, realize that, that there was no golden age of morality in our country. Um, Please understand, I mean, I, I, uh, I respect the flag. I'm an American citizen. I'm going to obey the laws to the best of my conscience and, and all these things. But um, there's only one enduring and incorruptible country and people and king, and that's Jesus Christ. And my loyalty is to the people of God in Africa, Nepal, the United States, Brazil, um, 
all throughout the world. That's where my loyalty is. And so I'm going to make every one of my political decisions not based on, you know, who do I think is going to save us? Because no one's going to save us. No political party is going to save us. And no political party is incorruptible or without corruption. I uh, vote based on this primarily. Um, abortion is my number one issue. We have seen witness the murder of 61 million babies. And now outside of the womb, and it will get worse. Old people, um, it, 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 it's just, you know, it doesn't stop because when abortion started, the promise was made. It would just be, you know, and the, the moment just a few, you know, days after pregnancy and things like that. And each decade, more and more and more to now, you can just kill a baby outside of the womb. And so I vote with regard to abortion. Who's going to stand against abortion? I vote also with regard to who is going to give the most freedom to the church. And, and that, but, but even those I vote for, I have no hope in. It's just those are my two biggest issues. Who is going to allow for the church to have freedom to proclaim and who is going to be against the murder of babies? Um, with regard to, you know, um, the, the gay community, I can, I can give you an illustration from my own life. One of the first, if not the first, case in the Midwest of AIDS was a guy by the name of Ron. And uh, I actually knew him. I knew him. And uh, I don't know if I don't remember if I was in Illinois living at the time before I went to seminary or if it was after I came, was in seminary, but came back for break. Uh, Ron was homosexual. Everybody knew it, um, you know, and uh, it was it was my goodness in the 80s, early 80s or whatever, or mid 80s. And um, I knew him. Friends of mine knew him. He worked at a clothing store. He was a, you'd see him in bars, things like that. Well, I came back and found out that he had this terrible disease that people were terrified of. And he was in the hospital in Paducah, Kentucky. And no one would visit him. No one. Doctors were wearing, you know, like not hazmat suits, but close to it to go in because no one knew what was going on. All his, uh, his lovers, whatever, had abandoned him, were terrified, everything. And I went over to the hospital, and uh, they didn't know how contagious all this was. They didn't know anything. All I knew is that Ron, I knew Ron, and Ron needed Jesus. And so I talked to the doctors. They cautioned me. I think they even had me sign a paper. And then they put this big suit on me <laughs> and a mask and head thing, and I went in there. And uh, I met with Ron like three different times. And it, it was, you know, he always took care of himself. You know, he always dressed really nice and, and everything. But when I went in there, it looked like a skeleton that had been wrapped in wet tissue paper with uh, just horrible, gigantic sores all over his body. And uh, he couldn't speak, but he could move his finger. And for three days, I talked to him about sin, about Christ's death, about God's total and complete forgiveness and restoration. And on the last day, I said, Ron, Ron, you know, where are you? You've heard me. You know, I've preached and preached and preached to you. And I said, Ron, do you recognize that you're a sinner? And his, I said, you know, if yes, move your finger. And he just went, and I said, do you now see what it means for Jesus Christ to have died on that cross? You know, are you repenting of your sin? Have you repented of your sin? Are you trusting in what Christ did for you, Ron? Ron, do you have the hope of heaven? You see, that's the Christian response. The, the problem is now laws are being passed so that we can't even do that. But, you know, no one at that time, I mean, doctors, nurses, I remember saying, you're crazy for going in there. 
we got to do some crazy things, but we got to do those crazy things in love. We need to be very, very wise. And we also, you know, here's the thing. You could say something to me right now, you, the leader there, and uh, I don't know you that well. And, and I could easily misinterpret it because I don't know you. And uh, I think that is oftentimes what goes on. I mean, uh, never forget the devil is a whisperer. Let me give you an example. If you get out of church uh, or you go to church on Sunday and you get out of your car and the pastor's walking across the parking lot and you say, hello, pastor. And he looks up at you with a very stern look on his face doesn't wave and then go, goes into the building. You don't hear somebody whispering in your ear saying, you know, maybe the pastor is going through a real trial or maybe he's got to counsel someone who's really struggling. That's not what's whispered in your ear. What's whispered in your ear is your pastor's rude. He doesn't love you. He doesn't like you. Do you see the way he just treated you? There is a devil and he's alive and well on planet Earth. And so you know, you hear a lot of a lot of gay people think that we are out to have them killed or put them in concentration camps. And then there are a lot of Christians who think that the gays are out there wanting to kill them and put them in concentration camps. And that has a way of breaking down communication. And what you have to understand, the less that you are in a Christian country and we're not in a Christian country. The more you have to build a relationship and the more you have to show people with your life who you really are. And there are people on this planet who know that I disagree with them, but that I would take a bullet for them. And defend them. You know, now I'm not going to defend their sin, but I will defend them as a person. And the image of God that remains within them. And not just that, we ought to genuinely care for people. And so politics is not the way to solve this problem. You know, I love that one poster that I saw. If you think the problem is really bad, wait till you see the government solution. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's good. Uh, thanks for sharing. Um, Yeah, if you could uh, if you could share with us, which you know we we can always watch a twenty minute video on uh, on YouTube about Chato's uh, conversion. Yeah, uh, how she became a Christian. Um, but what was really shocking to me personally was you know two thousand three in the summer after my freshman year, I heard this message on test of true belief. And I also think like biblical courtship or something like that, biblical manhood, womanhood. And then in the fall, you went to Hardin Baptist Church. You know, by Murray State, you spoke yeah. and you said, I want you to praise God with me. My wife became a Christian two weeks ago. Yeah. Look, then you're like, did you not hear me? And I was like, my wife became a Christian. Praise God with me. Uh, I think we're just so stunned. Like, what yeah. the heck did you just say? Oh, my goodness. You know, and I just, anyways, for me personally, I just became like, dude, I don't know if I'm really a Christian. I mean, even though I've heard you like a few months before, yeah. kind of like, hey, I am a Christian. Yes. But then I hear that. It's like. Crap, if Paul Washer was deceived, he married his own, you know. Yeah. Anyway, so you got married after you were a missionary for 10 yeah. years? Or? Yeah, and, and this is really, uh, it turns out to be a testimony completely different than what, it, it teaches us many truths that people um, would think just the opposite. You know, like, well, you know, Paul, Paul Washer is so hardcore that his wife was probably converted, but living with him, she probably thought she wasn't because... Paul Washer doesn't eat or sleep. He just fasts all the time and he prays and, and everything else. And, and, and it really helps you understand this whole idea of proving your salvation uh, through a change, you know, the life that you now have. And when I met my wife, she was young. And, um, you know, we, we ministered to street kids in the middle of the war. I'm talking about bombs blowing up. I'm talking about you'd come back with lice in your hair, everything. And here was this beautiful girl who would uh, do these kinds of things. I mean, um, and she loved the Lord and her parents really weren't positive on her being a Christian. And she, without being rebellious, she stood and, and all sorts of things. Just, I mean, a devoted, devoted, devoted person. And um, I fell in love with her and I fell in love with that. And 
And I really, you know, counsel and prayer and everything, it was everything flew in that direction of marrying her. And I did marry her. But after we were married, um, and, and this is very important, um, I started noticing some things, but I, I didn't say anything. Because you have to be very, very careful about the way you use authority. And sometimes it's better just to keep your mouth shut. After I married her, everything I believed about her was true. I mean, she went to places in the jungle where most, I had men go with me on the same trips and they broke down crying. And she would like, you know, shut up, quit acting like a sissy. And I remember she told a group of college students, if college guys, she said, if you could keep complaining, I'm going to shoot every one of you. I mean, she, she could, she could do it, boy. She could do it in the jungles, the mountains. She could eat stuff. A billy goat would puke up. I mean, <laughs> and she did it because she wanted to be a missionary. She wanted to be a missionary. She wanted to be godly. She wanted to be Amy Carmichael. She wanted. And but after a few years, I started noticing something. Just this. Her Christian life was discipline, discipline. And in time. If, if it's just discipline, it starts becoming slavery and then almost a, a bondage of just constantly fighting and striving to be devoted and this constant kind of performance type thing. And I would just pray and pray and, uh, and, and realize now I'm talking about a person who you know, we were in heavy terrorist area, war going on, bombs blowing up, machine guns, you know, and she was right there by my side. So can't fault her on any of that. But I just it just seemed like everything was a work of discipline and it was wearing her out, wearing her out. And we came back to the States uh, for a break and I went to preach in San Antonio in a tent uh, right beside a crack house. Uh, I'll never forget that. And it was a lot of people on the street and everything. And I was preaching and I, I preached on the evidences of conversion one night. And she said she was so miserable and she got in the car and left with the pastor's wife because we had to stay back and counsel people. And she said she was miserable. And um, she got in the car with the pastor's wife. And the first thing the pastor's wife said was, so Chato, tell me your testimony. And so Chato said, the whole time I'm telling her my testimony of getting saved when I was 12, God was just telling me it's a lie. Because she went to one of these Christian schools where, you know, even the preachers would say things like this. Well, all your friends have made their decision. You know, all your friends have prayed. Um, and she prayed that prayer and they confirmed her as saved. And that was it. And um, so she was, I noticed when I got home, she was kind of strange and um, we went to bed and we drove back to Austin, Texas the next day from San Antonio. And um, we were about probably half an hour or so away from arriving at the place where we were staying. And she looked at me and she said, do you believe that I am a Christian? And I said, Chato, I have no authority at all to tell you you are a Christian or to tell you you're not a Christian. I have authority to tell you what the gospel is and to share with you from the scriptures the evidences of conversion. That's all. I said the Holy Spirit, you know. And um, she said, I have great doubts. And I said, well, here's what we need to do. I'm gonna, we're gonna go home. It was by that time getting later. And I said, uh, I'm going to put our two little boys to bed. And then uh, I'm going to bed. I said, uh, you've heard enough sermons out of me from so many other people. I said, you don't need my counsel. I said, just get along with God. Just. And I said, but the one thing I would tell you is, are you working or are you resting? Are you working? to please God, or are you resting in the ever-pleasing sacrifice of his son? I went to bed, and about 1.30 in the morning, she woke me up, and she was, 
she was just glowing. I mean, and not, you know, I don't want to be like some kind of mystical or emotional, but the, she was glowing because the burden was gone. She was no longer working, no longer trying to prove, no longer trying to live up to a standard. She was resting in the finished work of Christ. And that's what genuine conversion and a mature understanding of conversion will do. That yes, our life has changed and will continue to change. But those changes, they're not the grounds for our resting. We're resting in the person of Christ. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, <clears throat> uh, that leads me to another, another question here is just uh, one thing that for me personally has uh, some things that you've said in the past. Um, well, one specific thing has bothered me. Um, of just so when it when someone has doubts or just kind of and even in a you know the gospel booklet here you know um, everything's really awesome. But one thing that kind of throws me off is a um, <clears throat> if a person realizes that they're not a Christian but they desire salvation. Um, I just love for you to clarify some things. You talked about like continue to cry out to God and seek Him in His Word until He's wrought a change in your heart. How is which obviously I know for sure. You know, it's like um, salvation's by you know in that you preach. You know, salvation's by faith and faith alone in Christ, and it's not our works, obviously. Yeah. But how? Can, for me, it feels like um, like I can misinterpret some of that. It can be like instead of just hey. Those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, or it's like genuine faith in Jesus. Hey, I realize I'm lost. It's like, God, save me. I trust in you. But for me in my past, it's kind of like, man, I cry out to God. It's like, how do I know when I'm crying out enough and I'm working hard? You know, just kind of like, God, how do I know? Have you saved me? Have you not saved me? It's like, uh, kind of this exhausting thing where I feel like, you know, we can feel like we're working our way to God. And it's kind of like, that's not faith. It's more like, or anyways, just... How would you clarify some of that? Well, first of all, thank you for that question. And, uh, you know, I'll bring that up to uh, even our editor, Joel Beakey, who I think he edited it. Um, here's the thing that's so important. You, you know, um, the things that I teach are not things that that were born with me. If they are, then they're wrong. You know, it's when we interpret the scripture, then we go back through church history and if if no one agrees with our interpretation and everyone else is in agreement about theirs, then we're probably wrong. And um, so the things that are in that book are historical and affirmed by history. Um, and yet uh, I've seen people take some of the things that even the Puritans have said. And it's kind of like if you put a knife in the hands of a surgeon, surgeon, he can save somebody's life. You put the same knife in the hands of an inexperienced person and they'll rip a person to pieces and kill them. And it seems like we're never in the center. Um, we see easy believism on one hand, you know, you prayed that prayer, you're saved. Uh, on the other hand, I've seen people where they make it so hard. I mean, no one could get saved. Um, they require a perfect repentance and a perfect faith you know, before you can have assurance. And both faith and repentance are evangelical graces and Christian virtues, which we grow in. So, and are never perfect. Um, so let me, saying that, let me explain. I will sit down and tell someone that the Bible commands us in order to be recipients of salvation to repent and believe. Then I will ask them, are you repenting? And I make it very, very clear. I'm going to show you in the scriptures what scriptures say repentance is. But I always give this caveat. I'm going to give you a description of biblical repentance that comes out of the scriptures and therefore is is pure, is perfect. And not even my repentance uh, adds up to that. So what I just want you to be able to see from the scriptures is is what is happening to you genuine repentance? Okay. Now, so I tell them that they must repent. I say, have you repented? And they say, well, I'm not sure. Well, then let's look at scripture. 
and they say, well, there's really not any brokenness over sin. I mean, I, I, I mean, I see what you're saying, but I don't see my sin as that is bad at all. Okay. And so the question is, what do you do with a person like that? That, that they're actually seeking God and yet they admit themselves. No, I, I'm going to continue on in my sin. I mean, I'd like to be saved, but I really don't see it's that bad. You really can't do anything with them. You can manipulate them. You can do all kinds of things, or you can just simply say, let's go back through the gospel again. And if you really are seeking God, then, then you really want to be saved, then do this. Keep reading through the gospel and the gospel promises and ask God to show you, to reveal to you your sin. And, and, and that's really what we're getting at here. When you take somebody through and you tell them the gospel and say, you know, would you like to be saved? Yes. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you show them John 3, 16. Believe. Do you believe this? And I've had countless people tell me, well, I see what you're saying. And I really think that's true. But is that it? I mean, I see it's true, and I say, but but is it true for you? Is it a reality? Is it bringing you joy? Are you resting in it? Well, not really, but I see it's true. Well, I can't tell somebody, great, you're converted upon that kind of testimony. What I will tell them is, let's keep seeking God. Let's keep crying out to God. Let's keep going through the scriptures because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. And so it's what it is, is just keep counseling the person in gospel truth until they can actually say, you know, I'm, I, I, uh, they, they, they're not crying, they're not broken, they're not ripping their clothes off, but they're going, you know what, I, I see this. I, I, uh, I see my sin. I see I can't save myself. And I'm trusting in what Christ did for me. You know, here's the thing that's real important that I bring up in my testimony is that I'm a guy who preaches a lot on repentance. And yet when you hear my testimony, even though I was a great sinner, you don't see me just falling on the ground and, you know, ripping at my shirt and beating my chest because of my sin. And, and I think if you look at Ichabod Spencer's pastoral sketches and just the history of conversions and testimonies, you find out that. In order to be saved, a person must repent, acknowledge their sin, and, and in a real way, they see it. But the manifestation of that is so different. I've met people who I have preached the gospel to, and they have literally, I thought they were going to collapse under the weight of their sin. They were so broken. It's like they had murdered a thousand people. I've met other people who I believe genuinely repented, and yet it wasn't manifested that way. They were swallowed up in the, uh, in the love and grace of God. They knew they were a sinner, but they were just overcome with joy immediately. And so you have to be very, very, very careful when you're dealing with souls. There will always be repentance. There will always be faith, but it will manifest itself in different ways. Okay. And so here, here's, let, let me say it this way. In superficial evangelism, someone will share the gospel and basically say this. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes. Pray this prayer. They pray the prayer. All right. Um, right now, welcome into the family of God. And the person is trusting in a prayer. The other way is take them, take them through everything about biblical repentance. And if they don't meet up to that perfectly, tell them God's not working. Or take them through biblical faith, and if they don't meet up to that perfectly, tell them God's not working. Both those extremes are wrong. The thing that I keep doing is just let's go through the scriptures again. Let's go through the promises again. And then what's happening to you? Tell me. Is there, do, do you have a, tell me about your sin. And, and you know, that's I've sometimes, and, and that this is what's so hard. I may I may work with a person over a period of weeks like I help campus outreach at Virginia Tech. I love I mean, I'll be there tonight, you know, and many of the students who come to know Christ, uh, they hear the gospel the first time and they like, oh, you know, I never heard. That's great. And that's wonderful. 
but it may be six weeks, eight weeks, two months, a semester, two semesters of going through the gospel with them. And then finally one of them, you know, wow, you know, the other night I was reading through this again and it became just real to me. I know Jesus is my savior. Okay, wonderful. You know, what we want to avoid is superficial evangelism. And we also want to avoid a almost a legalism. I knew a girl one time, I came upon a girl at a conference and she was probably 20. And I think she had read more of the Puritans than I had. She was miserable. And she had basically memorized just great passages and things on biblical repentance. And she says, this is not a reality. And I looked at her, I said, darling, that's not a reality in my life. You've set before yourself perfection and you've turned grace into works. You know, a mustard seed. So I, I hope that clears it up a bit. Yeah, that's really, really. Did, did you guys, did you hear the story about me and the guy from Alaska? I don't know. All right, this is, this will, this will clear it up for you. So I'm getting ready to preach in, in Alaska and the grizzly bear population outnumbered the people population. In that in that town, I'm not kidding. And uh, so I'm in this little church, and there's about 20 people, and uh, I, I'm getting ready to preach, and all of a sudden the back doors opened up, and a mountain of a man came through those back doors. I mean, he was probably 65, and he could whip every one of you sitting there in that meeting today. He was, I mean, you could tell this guy. You know, he beat up grizzly bears for fun. He was a man. And he was the saddest looking human being I've ever seen. He walked up and sat on the front row. And I just started preaching the gospel. And afterwards, I got done. I went right to him. I said, sir, what's wrong? He looked at me. I said, you, you without a doubt have the saddest countenance of any human being I've ever seen. And he pulled out a manila envelope. You know, like they give you at the doctor's office. And he pulled out these x-rays and it was showed his bones and they had all these black spots on them. And he said, I just got this from the doctor. They said, I'm going to die in like six weeks. I'm going to die. And he said, I've never been afraid of anything in my life. But I'm afraid. And he said, I, I lived all my life out in the bush on a cattle ranch. You couldn't even get to his place except by float plane or rafting or something. And he said, uh, he said, I've never been afraid of anything. He said, but I, I believe there's a God. And one time I heard some fella talking about this man named Jesus. All I know is I'm going to meet God and I know that I'm not prepared. And I said, well, you heard my message. He said, yeah. I said, did you understand it? He said, well, anybody could have understood that. And he's and then he said, is that it? I'm okay now because I understood what you said. Is that it? And I said, no, sir. And then he said, um, are you guys there? Yes, sir. Okay. And then he said this. He said, well, what, what do I need to do? And I said, well, the Bible says repent and believe the gospel. And he goes, well, how do I make myself do that? He goes, I believe what you said, but it's just in my head. I, uh, I'm not against it, but so I'm supposed to die with hope just because you told me that. And I think it's probably right. And I said, sir, here's what we'll do. I said, I have to fly back tomorrow. I'll cancel my plane flight back and I'll stay with you until one of two things happen. You get saved. Or you die and go to hell. And he was that kind of man. That's the way you needed to talk to him. He was a straightforward man. He said, fair enough. So I sat down and I said, faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And I said, so I'm going to take you through all the promises that I can find in the Old and New Testament about God and his power and desire to save and forgive. So we went through promises in the Old and New Testament for about an hour. And, um, and then I said, so tell me, sir, 
has anything happened to you? You know, and I, I don't need a, you know, I'm not talking about an emotional response. I'm not talking about a vision from heaven. I'm just talking about the assurance that you believe that, that God has done this for you in Christ. And he said, no. He said, I think you're a really good guy. And I think that uh, what you're telling me is true. But no, I don't have any peace. I'm going to die. And I said, OK, let's go through the promises again. And this is this is probably the most beautiful. Ministry moment of my life. He had his he had my Bible on his knees as we were sitting there in that pew. And I remember seeing his, I can still see his hands. They were huge. I mean, they, they, you know, and, and he had his hands on my Bible and I, I turned him to John 316 again. And I said, sir, let's just read through John 316 again. He goes, well, he goes, we've done that. And I said, I know. I said, but faith comes by hearing. I just want you. Let's pray. And then you just read that. And so we prayed. And and I'm not exaggerating. He uh he said, okay, I'll uh I'll read it. And he goes like this, he goes, his hands were on the Bible, and he goes, For God so loved the world that he uh and then he went like this, he goes, he gave, he goes, <laughs> he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And then he goes, I'm saved. All my sins are gone. I, I, Jesus died for me. I'm saved. I'm saved. And I said, how do you know that? And he said, haven't you ever read this verse before? <laughs> <laughs> do you see what happened? The spirit of God showed him the truth of that verse and he trusted in it and he said you must visit me tomorrow in my house you must come tell my wife this glorious story and i go there the next day to his house and he's just glowing tell her tell her about john three sixteen. tell her i'm going to heaven i'm going to you see now, most a lot of evangelists would have just prayed a prayer with that man. Souls are too precious to do that. Don't manipulate people. Don't coerce people. People are not numbers. You may have to deal with one student for four years on and off. And after that, you may never see any fruit, but fruit may come. The fact of the matter is share the gospel with them and then trust. You know, and don't put things on them that the scriptures don't put. You know, John 316 is what God used to save that man. Did did that text necessarily talk a lot about repentance? No, not at all. But did that man recognize his sin? He recognized it enough to throw himself on Christ and Christ alone. You see? Wow. That's powerful. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. That's very clarifying. Um, briefly, would you mind sharing um, <clears throat> just what some of the scripture references are that you would bring someone through, kind of go-tos for you with uh, someone at the point? Yeah. Um, when, um, when I'm talking about repentance, um, you see, it's not enough to tell someone, well, you need to repent. You need to explain to them what it means biblically. And in that little book you have, I think I talk about Saul of Tarsus. Um, and when I talk about repentance, I go to the Damascus Road. Because they ask me, what is repentance? And, uh, it's a, and it's a change of mind. And then I know what they're thinking, you know, well, that's kind of superficial. And I said, no, not really. I said, the Bible in the Bible, the mind is the control center of everything you are. OK, now you're all seated there very calmly right now because you think that that building is not engulfed in flames. 
So your your blood pressure has been determined by what you think, your actions, your emotions, everything. But if your thinking changed, it would change every other aspect of you, your emotions, your will, change you physically. If you thought that that building was engulfed in flames, your blood pressure would rise up, you'd start trembling, you would jump up out of your seat, you would run out of the building, do you see? So the, in the Bible, the mind is a big deal. So the Apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, thought that Jesus was the greatest false prophet in the history of Israel, and he thought that Christians were an enemy to the people of God. And he thought that, and so he was on his way to Damascus to imprison and possibly kill Christians, and all the while, he blasphemed the name of Christ. He gets somewhere on the road to Damascus, and what happened to him? His mind changed. It, it was a matrix, uh, like, you know, Copernicus moment. He, he realized, Paul realized at that moment, he was wrong about everything. He was wrong about everything that truly mattered. He thought Jesus was a false prophet only to find out he's the son of God. He thought Christians were uh, enemies of Israel only to discover they're the people of God and he was killing them. He realized he was wrong about everything. And what did he do? He changed his mind. Or his mind was changed for him, we could say. <laughs> and he goes to Damascus and he begins to proclaim the faith he once sought to destroy. Now, think about this. There's a girl in college, okay, and she's, she's really good looking. She's, she's like supermodel. And she knows it. And she lives most of her life in front of a mirror. Uh, she just cares about clothes and pop culture and her girlfriends and her boyfriends and how she looks and is, in she, is she in style. And, and she is just vain, vain, vain. And every day she goes to class, she sees this girl sitting there that's really plain. And before class, the girl has her Bible. Maybe sometimes she reads it. And so this really knockout girl and her little posse find it an enjoyable thing to make fun of this girl, to laugh at her behind her back, sometimes to her face, could care less about her, think she's an absolute failure, a zero. But one day, when the posse's not with her, this girl walks over to the plain girl and sits down and says, so what's that book all about? And she notices the kindness and the sincerity and a beauty on that girl that she can't figure out. And she hears the gospel and God begins to work. And that vain girl finds out what? It's, she's no different than the Apostle Paul. She discovers right there, her mind changes. She realizes she is wrong about everything. Her pop culture, her looks, her clothes, her friends, her status, she realizes that in everything that's important, she is totally and completely wrong. And her mind changes. And then so does everything else. That has been the best illustration I, I can use to describe biblical repentance. A businessman goes by a street preacher every day before he goes into the skyscraper he owns. He hates the guy. Because he, you know, he tries to be classy and posh and everything. And here's this guy in front of his building. But one day he listens to him and he discovers that all his wealth, his prestige, the respect he has, it's all worthless. And his whole life is wrong. Now, that doesn't mean the pretty girl stops being pretty. And it doesn't mean the businessman stops being a businessman. But it means that every direction of those gifts changes, you see. And then there's faith. Faith, please do not ever tell a college student that faith is a, um, you know, Soren Kierkegaard leap in the dark. Faith is not a leap in the dark. It's a leap out of the dark into the light of God's word. Faith is believing the promises of God, resting on those promises. And that's what Hebrews 11 is about. You know, the substance of things hoped for. You, if, if you take Hebrews 11.1 1 by itself, you can do some pretty ridiculous things. 
you know, think about it. I hope to fly. I think I can fly. I've never seen a man fly, but I have assurance. I have conviction according to Hebrews 1, 11, 1 that I can do it. So I climb on top of a building, jump off and die. Hebrews 11, 1 will lead you into heresy unless you realize it's in the context of God's inerrant promises. And, and one of the best uh, illustrations that I use when I'm witnessing to someone about faith is in Romans 4. And I use the definition of faith in 11.1 1 and show why it's necess there's a necessity to know the promises of God. And then listen to what it says um, in R Romans 4. Without becoming weak in faith, Abraham contemplated his own body, now as good as dead. He was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He looked at the physical possibility of him and Sarah having a baby. And it's zero. We have to look at our works. Our goodness, our religion and everything and recognize it. There's zero possibility of us being saved or right before God through those things. Then it says yet with respect to the promise of God. Now we need to know a promise. We need to know at least one promise. Maybe John 3:16. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief. And it says being fully assured, OK, that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. So when I talk to someone about faith, I go, as you look at that passage, John 3, 16, are you assured that what God has promised here, he has performed in you? Do you have eternal life? Is that are you trusting you see and um, now with regard to the death of Christ? There's something I always do and I almost never hear anybody do this even in modern evangelicalism among the best of preachers. I rarely hear this and yet if you were to read from Spurgeon on back through the 15th century all the way to Augustine. You would find this in every sermon and it's not mentioned anymore. When I talk to people, I will say this. Do you, do you want to know what the gospel is all about? I mean, really all about why Christ died, everything. And most of the time they'll say, well, sin, you know, they know enough to say sin. And I go, well, you know, sin is not the primary problem. And they go, well, what do you mean? And I say, well, let me give you this way. If if a mafioso was arrested, and was being taken to court. But as he's going to court, he's laughing and as he's sitting in court, he's laughing. Why is he laughing? Because he knows the judge that's going to judge him is just as corrupt as he is. But everything changes for that mafioso when he looks up and they quickly remove that judge and put a just and righteous judge in the place. I said man's greatest problem is not their sin. Their sin would not be a problem if God was unholy. Our greatest problem is God is holy and righteous and we're not. And then I always go to this. You see, here's here's the question. What does a really good and loving God do with people like us? And they go, what do you mean? Well, we're not good. We're not loving. So what does he do with us? And see, the the the, the greatest theological problem in the Bible is this. If God is good, he cannot forgive you. If God is good, he cannot forgive you any more than a good judge can forgive a criminal. A good judge, a man, a judge who forgives a criminal is not good. He's corrupt, you see. And the question, according to Romans three, is how can God be just and yet justify or declare righteous sinners? And the answer is found in this, the cross of Christ. That's what the cross is all about. It's about the harmony of God's attributes. God cannot show mercy at the expense of his justice. He must show mercy in harmony with his justice. And he does that on the cross. In his justice, he becomes a man, goes to the cross, 
and bears the punishment of divine justice in our place. And he pays for every bit of our debt. When he said it is finished, he paid for everything. Now God can be just and the justifier of the wicked because he paid the price with his own life, you see. And that's what I really center around constantly is that idea. The old writers would call it the harmony of the attributes of God. I've heard evangelists say this, instead of being just with you, God was loving. That's really sad because you're saying God's love is unjust. God must be just and loving. And he does that through the cross, you see. That's why the cross is the greatest manifestation of the glory of God, because it is the great moment when God's attributes are revealed in perfect harmony. When he, when he judged Sodom and Gomorrah, his attributes weren't perfectly revealed. His justice was, but not his mercy. When he showed mercy to Adam, his attributes were not perfectly revealed because he, rever he, he revealed mercy, but not justice. On the cross and his son bearing our sin and taking the wrath that was due us, he manifests his righteousness and his mercy in perfect harmony. And that's very important. <clears throat> So just to clarify, is that where you're saying that a lot of modern evangelicals don't preach? Yeah, they don't preach it. I've gone all around this world, and I can't tell you, if I had a dime for every time a person's come up to me and said this, after hearing that, I mean with tears, they've said this, I've been a Christian for 30 years. I trusted in the fact that Jesus died for my sins on Calvary. I'm a Christian. But I never really understood how him dying on a cross could actually pay for my sins until you explained that he was crushed under the wrath of God in my place. You see, and that's what this is all about. Everything is about the revelation of the fullness of God's attributes. And that needs to be put forward in our evangelism. You see. And it's really beautiful when you think about what he did. I mean, um, the multicolored, multifaceted glory of God in the cross of Christ. But just, I guess, clarifying, he didn't die just because we're the main purpose isn't because of our sin, but the main purpose is to glorify God, to glorify just God. And and yet God's glory is most revealed in our salvation and in what it took for our salvation. I, I'm, um, I've written several books on the gospel and, and things like that, but I've been working on a book for 25 years that no one's ever seen. It's a couple of thousand pages. It is, um, it is just on the cross, and it probably won't be done until I'm somewhere in my 80s. Um, as a matter of fact, when the doctors told my wife I was dead, she said all of a sudden in her heart, it was like someone spoke to her and said, he's not dead. He hasn't finished his book. <laughs> and um, so she told me, never finish that book. <laughs> and, uh, but what it does is um, I take every verse in the Bible that deals with the preexistence of Christ in glory, his incarnation, suffering, death, resurrection, ascension and uh, to the right hand of God, explain everything in Greek and Hebrew, and then go from the second century all the way up to modern scholars and take the best of everything and put it before God's people so that someone who can't spend 10 hours a day in a library can read the best of what, what happened. And right now, for example, I'm just working, I'm back to the first book. There's like six books. I'm redoing the first book again, and it's explaining the motivation, why God did all this. And one is his glory, which I've already dealt with that um, in the book. And the other is his love, to express his love. And, and that's an amazing thing, that uh, the eternal love of the triune God, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this perfect, matchless, 
infinite love, uh, the church is being invited into that and will one day know that fully. As the father has loved the son, so he loves the church. That, that when you start thinking about that, but God also saved the third motivation for joy. For joy. And it's not that without us, his joy would be limited. But his joy, his his joy is in the great work of redemption. That he has brought about in us, the changes he makes in us, the 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 love that we will return to him. But what you need to understand is that. The terminology that's used, especially in the Old Testament, is like when it says shouts of joy that he will he will shout with joy over his people. It is a, a joy. It says he will be quieted in his love and then he will shout with joy. It is a love that that brings silence into the heart of God that is so deep, but it can't remain that way. All of a sudden, then it explodes with a shout of, of love and that what you have to understand is that God is more joyful in you than you will ever be in him. He is more joyful to see you than you are to see him. He's more happy with pardoning you than you are with receiving pardon. I mean, is that not an encouragement? Because something's always whispering in your ear. He's just sick of you. Yep. You know, and, and, and that's such a it's it's a damnable lie. He, you know, in, in the book of uh, Solomon, it talks about, you know, with one glance of your eyes. You know, the groom is is excited and. And it, it, it's overwhelming, my young brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, someone came to our church and listened to me preach for about three weeks. I usually don't preach in the church. And uh, after about, you know, hearing me on three Wednesdays or something, they went up to one of our elders and said, has has Paul compromised? And the elder laughed. He said he knew what he was going to say. He said, what do you mean? And they go, well, we've been here for three weeks and all he's preached about is the love of God for his people, the unconditional love of God. And my and one of the elders said, no, what you're seeing for the first time is the real Paul Washer. Instead of all those YouTube things where he yells at everybody. <laughs> you see, the whole point that you've got to see is this. If your heart has been regenerated. The greatest motivation, your greatest need is to understand the love of God toward you. And the more you understand that love of God, the more you will fight against sin, the more you will stand against persecution. But most importantly, the happier you will be. I mean, you have no idea. You guys don't. I mean, I'm so much older than you and I've studied so much more than you. Let me tell you something. You don't have an idea even how much he loves you. Because I've been doing this for 35 years and I haven't even scratched the surface of how much he loves you. You, you almost want to do like Peter, you know, when Peter saw the, uh, you know, the miracle of the fish being pulled in and he said he fell down, and said, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. It's almost like Peter was saying to Jesus, look, this is wrong. This is wrong. You should never allow someone as wicked as me to see something so marvelous. And when you start understanding the love of God, my dear brothers and sisters, that's the way you're going to be. You're going to go, this is just wrong. I mean, this is too good. Don't you realize what I am? Don't you realize how much I fail? Don't. And, and, and if you belong to him, I'm going to tell you something that love, that's what you need to get to know. And it will not lead you to sin. It will not lead you to being careless. It will lead you to wanting to be holy, but not in a slavery sort of way. It will fill you with so much life and so much encouragement that even when you fail, you get back up again, not because you think sin is a light thing, but because you realize his love is so much bigger than your sin than anything. 
I just wish, I just wish that, I hope that you guys outgrow me in one thing, your knowledge of the love of God in Christ, because that's what will make you triumphant Christians, knowing how much God loves you. And it's all in the cross. It's, it's all there. And what he has in store for you, the, the new heaven and the new earth, you see, that new heaven and new earth, it's not, you know, a lot of times we look at our life. You're young. You don't do this yet, but you will. Um, you look at your life and you look back and go, you know, so many missed opportunities in the way I should have loved my wife or loved my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm getting older. Death is coming. There's so much I wish I could have done. There's so much. I used to say this. I wish I'm, I'm envious of the patriarchs because they lived 800, 900 years. And me, I only get 70, 75. And I'm not going to ever study physics or astronomy or all the, you know, things that I wanted. Because we somehow think it's going to come to an end and then we're going to inherit a completely different existence. That's not true. God is creating a new heaven and a new earth. It's this earth. It's that body of yours, but it's new. It's not just back in the garden. It's better than the garden, but it's like this. It's just perfect and incorruptible and perfect union with God. You see, if one of you guys is a runner, and you love to run. You love to run. You love it. Yeah, right here. Yeah. But <laughs> when you run, sometimes you have to be careful because you sit there and go, is my running competitive with my love for God? Am I running too much? Do I think about running too much? But see, there'll come a day when you will run in a new heaven and new earth. You'll run like you've never run before. But this is it. That running will in no way. You'll love running more than you did. You do now. But it will in no way be a com competition to your love for God. It will just make you more aware of your love for God. It will, it will be an expression of your love for God. And he'll watch you run. and He will delight in you. You see. It, it, it so much is waiting for you. Live here. Live here on this planet. Live here. Work here. Try to make everybody around you closer to Christ, more conformed to Christ. Love, serve, because your life, when it ends, it begins. Nothing will be lost. Your relationship with your wife or your husband will not be lost. It will change, but it won't be worse. It'll be better. You see, everything so heightened, so beautiful. And the love you have, for me, it's the outdoors. I have to be careful. Does this stream compete with God? Does this forest compete with my love for God? But there, it'll all just return to God in praise. You see. And... Uh, that all these types of things, when you start realizing what he has for you, it's going to make you so joyful. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength. When you realize that his love is immutable, oh gosh, what that will do for you. It won't make you complacent. It'll drive you. Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. Not his love for Christ, but his knowledge of Christ's love for him. You see. You got so much ahead of you. And that's a wonderful thing. Thanks for speaking so much hope and truth into our lives with the love of God. And, uh, well, we've stolen about 30 more minutes of your time than we agreed to. I mean, I'm down to keep on going if, you, if the love of God is giving <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm fine. Just keep going. All right. Well, uh, Thank you. All right. Well, uh, well, my my friend Austin over here, he has a he has a question for you. Oh man. <laughs> wow. Um. So this question is, is it this one? 
This one? That's one you sent me. Sorry. <laughs> um, how are works judged in a person that has accepted Christ since we know that our works are not what reconciles us to God? You, you're talking about the final judgment? Um, I think just more like, I guess, yes. Yeah, we can say that. You know, I don't know. Um, I really struggled with that issue. And for me, I hold that in attention, something like I do other doctrines. You see, there, there are many things we don't fully understand. And so we need to hold them in attention. For example, I know that God is one. And I know that there are three persons, distinct and real persons, that are God. Now, I don't know how that works. I really don't. I know that we are saved by grace alone. That is it. I mean, plus nothing. Plus nothing. I know that there is, some de there, there is a sense, though, that we will stand before God and we will be judged. And um, that adds a note of solemnity to me, but it doesn't cause despair. Why? Because uh, although I'm going to hold on to that, that I will stand before God, that my life will, in some way, what I've done will pass through the fire. I am aware that there are eternal rewards and eternal losses. I'm aware of all that. But I am aware of my complete and perfect standing in the person of Jesus Christ. I am also aware that those things that I have achieved, I'm not the author of. God achieved them by his grace through me. And so I can't answer all those questions. But for me, it, it, it is a motivation. Uh, although not the chief, but it is a motivation as it was in Paul's life, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, Christ tells us not to lay our, have our rewards on this earth, but lay up, uh, you know, treasures in heaven. All those things are held firmly in place, like a setting in a ring. Um, but they're set within the realm of salvation that is in 100% grace. And so I just hold those in attention. And I wish I could give you a greater answer. Um, it's a very difficult question. But hold those, hold what we do know in attention. And also know this, God did not send his son to die on a cross. So that the first thing you would see when you entered into a heaven was a scowl on the face of God because of all your failure. I, I sometimes wonder, you know, the Bible talks about, Paul talks about in Romans, a greater weight of glory. Um, and then Jesus talks about authority. Someone will be set over many cities. And, um, you know, I know men that um and women that reflect even now in this life they seem to have a greater capacity of of the glory of god and they seem to reflect it to a greater degree than i do have you ever met someone like that well you, you know what I, I don't envy them and it doesn't make me feel sad about me i just marvel in in that reflection and the grace of god in them okay and then i know people uh men particularly i could mention a couple that have such spiritual authority that if if me and a whole bunch of guys that are pretty well known are all in a room together talking i know one man who if he walks through the door without demanding anything everybody gets quiet and just looks at him and waits for him to speak he has a spiritual authority, do you see, that I don't have. And I'm not envious of that. I marvel in the grace of God. And I know that whatever, you know, 
when I see Charles Spurgeon or I see, you know, somebody like that in heaven and and maybe they have a greater weight of glory than me and greater authority or whatever, it's not going to be a cause for jealousy or a cause to be sad about my own condition because all that's gone. I think mostly it will cause me to marvel in the grace of God. So uh, I keep that in, in, in kind of in that context. And uh, I'm sure if someone sees this video, they'll try to tear that part apart. But <laughs> I, I just don't understand very much about that. <laughs> oh, well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, feel free at any point to shut down the conversation. Yeah. I'm good if I'm going. If anyone needs to eat and roll or leave, feel free. But I'm I'm zoned in. Uh, <laughs> Um, another question is, um, yeah, can you share a, a story? Oh, you wrote this one too. Here you go. Oh, yeah. Um, can you share a story with us of a moment in your life where you really struggled to enjoy Jesus? And maybe what was it that brought you back to enjoying Christ? And what promises did you cling to that just became sweet, I guess, in that moment? Yeah. Um, Every struggle in my life comes back, is, is eventually overcome and healed by a greater knowledge of the love of God in Christ and the perfect work of Christ on our behalf. Um, I have nothing. I would have no security, no hope, no comfort, no anything apart from the power of the cross. Um, but I was raised kind of in a thing where my father was really demanding, if you made a 95 on a test, why didn't you make a hundred. If you scored 20 points, why didn't you score more? There were five shots you could have taken. And I was never really in the inward circle, you know, of cool guys or this or that. Um, always wanted to be. And it kind of that hung out with me. I know it's really immature and carnal, but it was like this thing where, all right, I'm going to make it into God's inner circle. OK, I'm not going to be outside. I'm going to be one of his top guys, you know. And when I was in Peru in the first probably three and a half years, four years. Man, I, I can honestly tell you, I, I did a lot of probably wrong things. I was so immature. But man, I worked 16 hours a day, 18 hours a day. I risked my life. I made sacrifices. I. And it was all, even though I wouldn't have said it in the back of my head, it was all just to be God's guy, you know, to be kind of that, you know. I didn't want Jim Elliott to outrun me. I didn't want, you know, I wanted to be in that circle. And um, one day I just collapsed. I, I just kept getting more and more miserable. And I, I remember where it was, it was on the third floor of this old building we rented. And... I just kind of collapsed there on the stairs. And I actually said this. I mean, God has mercy. I said, God, I, I fear you. I don't want to die and go to hell. Um, but I don't want to die and go to heaven and see your disappointment in me. You know, just I didn't live up to what I wanted to be. I can't go anymore. I can't work any harder. And, this wasn't about salvation. It was just about something else. And you can call it pride. I don't care what you call it. It's just a matter of fact. It's just the way it was in my life. And, and you know, I, I didn't have a vision or something, but just Bible verses, you know, that I'd read about the love of God, uh, especially Romans 8, uh, things like that just kind of started coming to memory. And uh, I realized that that the love of God is just absolutely perfect, that everything is in Christ, that he, he doesn't just legally, forensically accept me. Now, that is the basis. All right. It is a legal forensic righteousness. And but it's not just I'm in some impersonal covenant. And God really doesn't like me, but. You know, he made an agreement, but a genuine, real love of a father to a son. 
founded upon the perfect work of an elder brother. And I realized at that moment, I did not have to move a half inch to my left or a half inch to my right to gain some greater love of God. And that's what I would want for all of you young believers is to is to see that that I mean, look, there's this girl in my church and she's a lovely, lovely kind of college age girl. She struggles with assurance. And uh, she doesn't anymore, but she did. And when she would come to me, I'd always look at her and say, dear, you're forgetting what I told you. There's only one hero in this story. And it's Jesus, our elder brother. And that's what we rest on. And, and that was a defining moment for me. Um, you know, God didn't look around the earth and say, oh, there's a Spurgeon. Wonderful. I found him. You know, God <laughs> didn't find a Spurgeon. He created a Spurgeon. God didn't find an Apostle Paul. He made one. And he made you. You and I might not be as, it, you know, we might not be apostles or the prince of preachers like Spurgeon. We might not be a, a Jim Elliot who lays down his life. Um, but he, he's making us. He has a plan for us, just like the exact, we fit in his ring in the same way that Spurgeon does, in the same way that all those other guys do. And, and that's what you need to hold on to. That you right now will not be more loved in heaven than you are right now. And you will not be more right with God in heaven than you are right now. Now you will be transformed and glorified and no longer have to deal with sin. But as far as your position before God, it's perfect now. And that's why even when he has to discipline you, he disciplines you not out of anger or wrath or judgment. He disciplines you out of love. You see, nothing can change that. Your sin is not stronger than the redemptive work of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's a wonderful thing. Another question I have is, <clears throat> so this is actually reading day. It's a day of people are preparing for finals. And then uh, they're about to go on their, you know, summer break. And... Um, <clears throat> You know, me and David over here, we're going to Mexico, and, you know, um, but anyways, uh, a couple are going to summer project, but just in general, people might be going home, or just what advice would you have, you know, counsel of, of pursuing God, and knowing him, and just, you know, protection from temptation, and just... Well, go to sleep for a while. That'd be the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um... When you go home, if you go home to your home where your parents are, uh, especially if they're unbelievers or you feel like they're not quite where they ought to be and you've grown a lot at college, submit yourself to them, love them, and listen more than you speak. Um, pray for them, honor them, bless them. Um, the other thing is, is, look, you need to develop not just for the summer, but, you know, 365 days a week, you need to develop life practices, life disciplines. And those two that you need to develop, most importantly, you need to work on this summer. And that is your daily reading of Scripture and your daily communion with God in prayer. Now, look, I, I've got books all behind me. I got them piled on my desk everywhere. If a messy desk is the sign of a genius, well, then Einstein's an idiot compared to me. But, <laughs> but let me share with you something. No amount of books, none of them, uh, take the place of the book. And I have met people that have really good theology, but as they're talking to me, I realize that they got their really good theology just from books and not from the book. You can really tell uh, a lot of times. And um, so I want you to develop a the daily life discipline of reading scripture. And I want you to do that, not sporadically. I mean, if you were to start war and peace in chapter 13, I would think something was wrong with you. 
you know, read through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. If you've never read the Bible at all, start in Matthew and read through to the book of Revelation, then start in Genesis and read all the way through to Revelation, and then make that a practice. And you know your capacity. For example, some people have the capacity to read 10 chapters a day. I do not. Five, I do not. I've settled on with my daily reading, even though it's my job to study the scriptures, and I may, I may study 12 hours. Um, that does not take the place of daily reading. And so I sit down, read through the Bible. And that was one of the Puritan strengths. I mean, when someone asks us a question about the Holy Spirit, we go to John 16. They went to some obscure text in the Minor Prophets because they, they knew the Bible, you see. And so now here's something very important. There's reading and praying with your boots on and your boots off. OK, this is very important. You learn this. Uh, reading with your boots on, that's reading the Bible and it's work. That's when I'm studying, for example, for a sermon or right now dealing with a Hebrew uh, noun that I'm having to deal with and try to figure out what on earth it really means. Um, that's hard work. And if that's all I did with the scriptures is dissect it, um, pretty soon you burn out. That, that's reading the Bible with your boots on. Working, struggling, makes your brain really tired. I need reading the Bible with my boots off. So that means getting up in the morning, cup of coffee. Uh, you know, amen. Yeah. <laughs> to wake me up, pour it on my head, and then I had two cups. I pour one on my head, and then I drink one. Uh, <laughs> the, and just reading. I don't have to understand everything. I don't have to dissect everything. I just want to read it to enjoy it. Just like I would read a letter from my wife if she was a long way away. I want to read it. If, if some big question comes up, I, I may jot it down, but I'm not going to go to the library and try to. No, this is just to meet with God and read his word. Now, it's the same way with prayer. Many people go, man, prayer is hard work. And I go, well, it depends on what you're talking about. Intercession is hard work. It's warfare. <laughs> Not, I'm sorry, I don't find much fun in it. Interceding for nations, for the end of abortion, interceding for all these different things, interceding for my friends that are hurting or struggling with sin, or interceding for myself or my family. Or It's hard. If that's all your prayer life is, pretty soon you're going to burn out. But while you're reading the Word, commune with God. And then when you finish reading those three chapters, or I'm sure you guys are a lot more spiritual, 30 chapters, as you're reading through that, <laughs> when, you know, talk to God. Maybe even some of the things you find, talk to him about them. Uh, rejoice in him. Walk with him. Uh, I don't want to be irreverent. I hate this irreverent, flippant attitude people have today, but just sitting down with him. The old guys called it a tryst, you know, a, a meeting with God. I love to walk uh, in the woods and things, and sometimes I'll just walk down our lane and talk to the Lord about all sorts of things, enjoy him, commune with him. I have found that, that usually uh, women are, um, for some reason, are a lot more given to this, or, or, but you men need to really struggle and, and get to the point where, you know, you're just opening your heart to God uh, and you're seeing things, you know, like, I enjoy things. I enjoy talking to him about things. And, and so you need both those things, boots on, boots off. And you, need, you work on that this summer. You know, there's two things. Well, if we want to really let's let's put three things out here. Cultivate the mind of Christ. Cultivate a relationship with Christ, and then cultivate a relationship with the people of God, with God's people. You know, I love that word. I love the word cultivate. In the book of Psalms, I think 37 in the New American Standard, it's cultivate faithfulness. I love that because it is, you know, the Bible talks about you reap what you sow, you know, you're, you're plowing, you're sowing, you're reaping, and hopefully it's good fruit. So that's a word that you need to remember, cultivate. Man.
and guys enjoy yourself and enjoy yourself and you know enjoying god um after i became a christian um i praise god that i worked really hard and i was serious but i missed a lot of wonderful opportunities uh at relationships with people that if i could go back i would have probably been more relational uh, especially when you're in college it's such a unique time you you have so many people around you um and um and it's a great opportunity it's a great opportunity see i'm not near as mean as you thought i was <laughs>